I hope you take my puppy seriously, by the way. That's, her name is Emily, and she jumps up and down. She wants to get your attention, ask you to join our fun drive and make a contribution on thinktechhawaii.com. Why don't you do that and help us out? We do have bills, you know. Meanwhile, today is Wednesday afternoon. We're here to talk tax with Tom. That's Tom Yamachika. Very important we have this conversation, especially during the legislative session where no man's life or property, no woman's life or property is safe. Yeah, we're Welcome talking about other you. kinds of bills, actually. <laughs> well, let's talk about what's happening here as we go into the ninth inning. It's almost over. I don't know if that means a, a gasp of uh, you know, relief or a, a gasp of success. Uh, what's, the, what's the relief and what's the successes? Tell well, us now. Well, here uh, we're at the point where we don't know what's going to happen because um, the negotiations that happen from this point on are generally backroom. Uh, the committees don't necessarily meet until they have a conference draft ready and they, and they meet to announce the vote in public. But by that point, it's normally a done deal. So uh, lots of stuff is happening that we don't know about. And this is the part of the session which I think is the scariest time. You know, one thing that strikes me when you say that, Tom, is, uh, you know, we know a lot of bills sail into conference, and it's a black box. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know what they do until after the fact. They fill in blanks and the like, and it's actually troubling. We never found a way to reform on this. We really should reform this so the legislature is more transparent. Uh, we need to have government that we can be confident about, that we can like. That's not likable. Um, but what strikes me is that, you know, there may be a difference between bills that affect one part of our lives and bills that affect other parts of our lives. Um, for example, as some bills, I expect um, they wouldn't go to conference because they're too black and white. And, uh, you know, all the, all the talking and arguing is already done, um, and there's not that much to be, you know, resolved in conference, and we don't want to have a black box about those bills. They're too black and white. So we, we sail them through, and there is more transparency. Other bills, well, you know, we don't want to talk about it in public. I say we, I mean the legislature. And we want to do it in private. We want to fill in blanks so nobody knows exactly what the, what the score is. Um, and so that's the way we do legislation in two separate styles, really. But my question to you is, is it true? My impression is that we have more bills in tax that go into the black box than other types of bills. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of been my impression over the last few years, uh, that a lot more of these tax bills are, are being uh, you know, blanked out. You know, when you, when you like, like the amount of credit or the tax rate or credit rate or things like that, they're, they're being blanked out. They're, they're sending them to conference with blanks and basically getting the conference committee to fill in the blanks. You know, my, you know, what I wonder about is, when the legislature is voting on these bills to send them to conference, they're voting, they're voting on blank bills. Do they, do they realize they're doing that? And it makes a big difference what's in the blank. Huge, substantive difference. It yeah. could be a great bill or a terrible bill, depending on what's in the blank. Yeah, one of them, uh, House Bill 1190, I call, I call it the blankety-blank bill. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, it's, it's to adjust income tax rate. And as originally introduced, it was supposed to like lop off the income tax for people who are making below the poverty line, and then you know have the measure revenue neutral, so the uh, so so the brackets get kind of you know smushed up through uh, higher earning taxpayers, um, because it really doesn't make any sense for us to start taxing people who are making three thousand dollars a year. They're not likely to pay it anyway. Uh, that that's another thing. Um, but during the legislative process. Each of the amounts and each of the tax rates got replaced with a blank. So it's now, you know, uh, you, you, for the tax, the tax bracket here, that your tax is blank plus blank percent of the excess. Blank, blank percent of the excess. You know, eight or nine brackets like blankety that. Blankety-blank. Blank. Blankety-blankety-blank. Blank. 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 That's really awful. And I mean, here, you know, we, before we started the show, you and I were talking about in Congress and the Tax Relief uh, Act. 
Reform Act, Reform Act. I got to say that quotes Reform Act of 2017, where there were no hearings in Congress, zero hearings, 2,000 pages of legislation affecting our lives, no hearings. We never heard what the argument was for or against, what the numbers should be, what the aspiration of the legislative body was. They just did it behind our behind our backs, I have to say. And we went along with it. So my question is, in the state legislature, on this blankety-blank kind of thing, weren't there hearings? Or let me put it this way, were there hearings? Yes, there were. Where legislators and witnesses and experts and the tax office and economists and business people all got up to say, well, it's the rate should be this and the cutoff should be that and, and so forth. And, um, in, and they advocated for, for numbers so that the public would know what, what's going to be in that bill. Yeah, well, in this case, they didn't. Um, they, they just said, we support the bill. Uh, and I'm thinking, support what? The bill's full of blanks. How can you support the bill if it's full of blanks? When you're talking about tax bills, in principle, it's not good enough because it's all about numbers. Tax is all about numbers. So merely to support the bill is not good legislation, and it's not fulfilling their duty, in my opinion, as sworn representatives. Well, I mean, at least they ought to give us something to, to debate. Um, you know, there, there, there's, there's really no, I guess, and, and maybe, maybe this is the justification for it, uh, in conference committee, they can, they can amend all the numbers anyway. Right. So if there were, if there were some numbers in previous drafts, and, and uh, you know, at least people can argue for or against the adequacy or sufficiency of those numbers, uh, then you know, if they want to, they can change them in, uh, later, later on down the line. Anyhow, but at least when you have numbers in the, in, in the draft, it allows for debate. You know, if, if, there's, if there's nothing there, what do you debate? There were never numbers in, in the blankety blank bill. Uh, uh, there, there were numbers in the bill as originally introduced. Mm. Okay. But after it went through a couple of committee hearings, it was blank, blank, blank. So was there testimony about how the blank should be filled in? There was testimony, but just basically supporting the concept or not but supporting not the But not about the numbers. Not about the numbers. So effectively, it was an abdication, even by the people who, who were advocating for or against the bill, um, as to how to fill in those numbers. And, it strikes me that how can the legislature do a decent job if it doesn't have a record of the information, the data necessary to achieve those numbers? Uh, or better yet, if they did have the data, I don't know if they did, I kind of doubt it, um, then how does that, why, why do we have to wait till the conference committee for them to actually digest, interpret, and come to a conclusion about that? Why can't they discuss this in the committee hearings? Why do we have to wait and find out by surprise, by ambush in a way? <laughs> well, that's, that's the, I guess, a strategic decision. They want to ambush the taxpayer, that's, what they, that's, that's how you do it. That's mm. how you do it. Not, not really acceptable, in my opinion. Anyway, okay, what else you got? Um, I'm sure you got, you know, actually, Tom, Tom gave me his current matrix, and it's like uh, six pages, five pages long, more, and it's got all these bills that are still alive. Uh, let, me, let me ask you, just to preface this, why? We have all these tax bills, which are you know potentially threatening to us. They are still alive in the waning days of the legislative session. Couldn't they get killed somewhere? I mean, if they weren't appropriate, why there's so many of them? Well, they, I, I think uh, the prevailing philosophy is to keep options on the table. Um, I, I, I think we talked last time about Donovan's dozen, uh, where. Uh, the, 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 the chair of the Ways and Means Committee had a number of revenue raising bills on his whiteboard. And the, I guess the idea was that if a certain amount of revenue had to be raised, then they would take this bill and say, okay, we've got to pass this. Okay, send it to the governor. Um, so maybe that's kind of the philosophy that we keep a whole bunch of stuff alive and uh, after the, you know, the budget requests come in and those get debated and they figure out how much, how much dollars they're going to need, uh, that's when they decide what lives or dies. Mm. Are any of these bills, you think, uh, targets for, what is it called, um, 
gut and replace or bait and switch, whatever, <laughs> however you want to put that. Are these, are these potential uh, containers for that sort of thing? Uh, every one of them is, is really? probably a potential container for a gut and replace. Another ambush. Yeah, I mean, um, a number of these bills have general titles like relating to taxation. So you, so you don't like a GE bill and you want to put in a, a, a hotel room tax bill? You know, toss one, put in the other one. Now, the um, House and the Senate rules uh, don't permit that. Okay. Except, and there's always an except, uh, when leadership agrees. So you need the approval of the Speaker or the, or the Senate President. Why does that give me so little comfort? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You just don't trust the government, maybe. I don't know. Well, so, you know, the interesting thing is we can sit here, you and me, we can sit here, we can discuss the tax policy around these bills. We, we won't have time for all of them, but a few of them anyway. And we can, you know, get a handle on whether we like them or don't like them, whether we think they'd be beneficial or not for the state. And then at the last minute, um, they can be all gut and replaced or bait and switched, whatever. They can be changed completely. And our discussion becomes completely moot because that's not what the bill was about when we discussed it. Yeah. That's right. It happens. It happens. It's happened before. I mean, the, the um, suit by uh, Common Cause and League of Women Voters uh, is still alive. Okay. Um, uh, I, 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 I know the, the, the trial judge ruled against the, the plaintiffs, uh, but there's still the possibility of appeal. And I, and I think the, the plaintiffs were, were planning to appeal anyway. Um, if, it, if it had gone against them. Uh, and that, that suit challenges the, the gut and replace concept. Um, the, and the trial judge, of course, just said, well, you know, the, these guys were following the rules, and that's a, that's a legislative function, so, you know, suit dismissed. That's probably the end product, isn't it? If the legislature was following its own rules, well, it's entitled to do that. Is that is that where the Supreme Court would go? Maybe um, uh, the plaintiffs in the suit were trying to say, well, there are constitutional requirements. Okay, the federal constitution. No, ours too, okay. because we have like the th what we call the three reading requirement. A you know, bill has to be read throughout three times in each house before passage. Okay, and that is supposedly according to the the nineteen fifty um, proceedings of the Constitutional Convention at at the time, you know, it was 1950 amendment. Uh, they wanted to make sure that you know, these bills were adequately debated and and uh, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but but how can you have a debate about a debate about something that that's totally extraneous to 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 uh, what the enacted bill is? You know, these these rules in the legislature they cannot yield public confidence. Nobody can be confident of the result when you have rules that allow this sort of thing. And I really wonder, I can't remember that it ever happened, I really wonder if there's any um, campaigner, any, anybody running for public office um, who would say, wait a minute, if you, if you vote for me, I am going to make a, a big campaign in the legislature to clear up these bills that are um, you know, uh, anti-transparency bills. I mean, these rules that are anti-transparency bills. I never heard that said. But that would work for me, and I would vote for somebody who came up with that, because I really think the legislature has to be more transparent, especially on bills that have such a profound effect on our lives, like tax bills. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I get to this point, though, I usually get a headache. I get a splitting two-sided headache. And uh, what, I, what I need to do, Tom, at this point is to take a break, and try, to, try to relax a little bit, and then we'll come back in one minute. All right. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at five. I'll see you there. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. 
We welcome you to tune in and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at three o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Okay, here we are. We're back from our break. We're talking tax with Tommy Amachika, president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation. I feel a little better now. A little, a little rest in the break helps. But let's, let's. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that flask also helps a little bit more, doesn't yeah, no, it? No, I'm not telling you what's in the flask. Okay, very good. <laughs> so tell us about, um, you know, some bills that have actually gotten, that, that have been successful, that have been passed by both houses already, even before the end of the session, which which ends in the first week of May, um, and which, which are, have been signed or going to be signed because there's no issue about, can you talk about that? There, there are a couple of tax bills that have already become law. Um, one of them uh, is Act 3, uh, Senate Bill 1361, uh, that raises our estate tax for uh, estates, taxable estates over $10 million, and basically uh, adopts a marginal rate of 20%, which I believe is the highest in the nation, uh, which had with Washington State. That's already so, law. This means that if you are a Hawaii resident, I don't know about a visitor, but a resident, huh? and, then, and, you, and you're worth more than $10 million, uh, what, everything above the $10 million would be subject to a 20% tax on your debt. Well, uh, it'd be, it'd, it started about $15 million, I think, because there's, there's like $5 million or so, which is the unified credit, uh, that you know, people are allowed to pass without taxes. And then after that, the taxable estate starts. So there's the 10 million plus the unified credit amount gives you, um, I mean, that, that's when you get it's into- It's a flat 20. rate though. No, um, it's graduated. So uh, at uh, lower um, taxable estates or you know, less valuable taxable estates, uh, I think the tax kicks in, for, uh, for example, I think it was seven and a half percent and then it, it goes up and all the way up to yeah. twenty. Yeah, it, it 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 it's progressive like the income tax. I thought the uh, tell me if I'm right about that. I thought that the state inheritance taxes on, in in state law, state tax laws, are going out these days, and that there are not that many states that have it these days. Mainly because the Fed, you know, has been so soft on a state tax in the past ten or fifteen years. Well, um, it it used to be that the uh, that the federal estate tax gave a credit for state death taxes, and many states uh, said, well, okay, we'll, we'll impose a, a tax at the same amount of the credit, so taxpayers didn't have to pay any more, but the state would get some money, mm. and, and, and the feds would not. Tailgate, or, right? It, it would all follow the state, the federal tax. Right, yeah. right. Um, but, but now the, there is no federal tax for a lot of people, so maybe this is the state's way of stepping in? Uh, that's one possibility, certainly. But, but yeah, the, the federal estate tax doesn't work the, the same way anymore. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What, what's what are the tax policy considerations on this? I know it's gonna it's gonna be law or it is law, but um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is you drive away the very rich people. Do do we care? Was that considered? Do or we not care about that? Uh, I think um, people consider it and don't care. Um, we we've been trying to tell folks at the legislature that um, people don't just vote at the ballot box, they vote with their feet. And Hawaii has been losing people. And this is, I think, one reason why. Uh, having a, a business unfriendly reputation, high taxes. Um, if you don't have something to keep people here, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna jump on a plane. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, what about people we've known and heard of? What about Steve Case? I I think he lives here, doesn't he? And uh, Piero Midiar, he lives here. And uh, Zuckerberg in Kauai, they're worth more than $10 million. Um, is this going to have an effect on, well, I, I think it will have an effect on them. Uh, are there ways that they could avoid that effect? Uh, uh, will they take some action to ameliorate the effect of this uh, new law? Well, when I was in private practice, that's, that's a lot of what we did. 
um, you know, we consulted with people who had potential tax problems and find that, you know, find, uh, you know, ways within the law uh, to uh, minimize the burden. I mean, people uh, can afford to have these conversations with their, you know, with the tax professionals. And I think, you know, uh, those who watch your show, you know, could benefit from that as well. You can use trust, so, um, to uh, effectively skirt this, skirt this tax, I suppose. Um, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Okay. Well, maybe that's a subject for another day. Right. What other, what other bills uh, are a fait accompli? <laughs> um, uh, one good thing uh, is, is that the, uh, uh, the proposed general excise tax hike for education, you know, for uh, the teachers as well as the university folks, uh, that uh, appears to be very dead. Um, there was some there was some last minute maneuvering uh, so that it would pass one of the lateral deadlines, but uh, still uh, the house didn't hear it, and um, it's unlikely to come up in conference. Mm. And what about the uh, and this isn't directly tax, but it is a kind of tax on small business. The minimum wage bill, where is that sitting? Uh, there is a version that's still alive. That's going to conference as well. One thing I caught that was very interesting, really chilling, is that, I don't know if it's the final form of the bill or how many final forms of the bill there are, but um, it was it called for one number uh, for employees uh, of the business community, and it called for another number, a higher number, for state employees. So the minimum wage for state employees would be $2 higher than employees not working for the state or government, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I really was uh, astounded by that, why there should be the, this, this disparity between government and non-government. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we, we don't consider that a tax bill, so. So, okay, let's, yeah. let's leave it there. People can read up on it and see. Yeah, there are, there are other groups like the Hawaii Employers Council that follows bills like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So what else, what else is uh, likely to become law or likely to have failed? Well, um, we have, we're going to have a lot of activity in transient accommodations tax. Uh, the Airbnb bill is back. It's, it's again being hotly debated. Um, there are a couple of competing versions of it. Uh, some would make the you know, registration to collect tax on behalf of uh, the individual host mandatory. Uh, some would allow it voluntary registration, like the bill was originally introduced a few years ago. Uh, so that's still kicking around. Uh, there was a movement at one point to allow the counties to surcharge the TAT, uh, but that no longer appears alive. Although, you know, who knows what may come up in conference. Um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, a bill that was approved last year to uh, to bring what they called resort fees under uh, the transient accommodations tax. Uh, it was vetoed last year because resort fee was basically anything that a hotel charged tourists. So, so this year they kind of uh, went back and said, okay, we'll, ha we'll impose the TAT on mandatory resort fees, which means if you are staying the night and you can't get out of this fee, then it's essentially part of your room charge mm. for the night. Mm. And that's the, uh, the current enforcement position. That's what the, the Department of Taxation said anyway. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so that's uh, on its way to the governor's desk, but mm. likely to be signed. Mm. Well, two things come out of that for me. One is uh, if I were <clears throat> a self-respecting hotel, I would take everything that might be considered mandatory and make it not mandatory. The other, the other question I want to ask you is, uh, you know, where, where does the leadership on, on tax things come from? I mean, I would assume just knee-jerk that the governor would be driving tax policy because the governor is, you know, interested or should be interested in the economy in general and, uh, you know, the way, the way the economy works, the way the money flow, and uh, the way income to people and all that life, quality of life, quality of economic life in Hawaii. 
And therefore, that would be on his desk somehow, wouldn't it? And my question is that... Well, we haven't seen any of Am that. I right about that? Uh, does he do that? Is he down there? Is, the, is DBED down there? You go to these hearings. You see who shows up. Yeah, well, the departments are down there, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the governor's chief of, chief of staff is there often. But I've never seen the governor there. Are they, do they have a, a tax policy plan uh, about where they want taxes to go, where they want, how they want taxes to affect the economy? Um, at, at one point, there was, uh, I mean, the governor had a, a senior policy advisor who, who dealt with that, but, but uh, they needed her to run budget and finance, so she isn't there anymore. Um, she's doing other stuff. And so I, I don't know who or what is filling that position in the governor's office. Well, it'd be interesting because you, as the president of the, of the uh, Tax Foundation of Hawaii, would love to meet with that person if there was such a person. Because you would like to uh, express your philosophy about these things, right? And find out what was on the, on the griddle so that you could participate in some way in, in how that tax policy is going. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah, um, I'd want to do that. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be given the chance. Okay, well, maybe yeah. someday. They're, they're, someday, Tom. They're, they're busy. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Everybody's always too busy. But they're not too busy to raise our taxes, are they? Mm, that's uh, right. So, um, okay, so here we are, and we're almost done. And um, I just wonder how you, how you whether it's, it's, it's early or late for you to say how this legislature has been doing, how it will have been doing in taxes in 2019. Well, at this point, there are, there are really too many blanks. You know, I, I have no idea um, what they're putting through. I, I will have you know, a better idea once the, once the final decking deadline comes up. Um, but as of right now, uh, there, there, there are too many measures and too many blanks within the measures to, to give anybody a, re a realistic idea of. Um, or How about fiscally? Can you say, or is it too early or late? Um, how how fiscally, what you're doing in terms of fiscal management? Fiscally, they're, they're trying new stuff this year. I think I've explained that to you before. Um, instead of having you know, one legislative committee look at the whole budget, uh, at least on the House side, they've tried to basically uh, come up with a baseline number, uh, pass that, and that's, I believe, House Bill 2, and then have different subject matter committees look at their own departments under their purview uh, and, and, and scrutinize those a little much, much more harshly. Mm -hmm. um, what I've heard is that a couple of committees did find stuff. Um, Takashi Ono's uh, Interstate Commerce Committee uh, found some stuff in DCCA, some idle funds. And, um, and I believe uh, um, the uh, House Labor Committee uh, uh, found some stuff in Department of Labor as well. So what, what's going to become of that, I don't know, but um, at least there's, there's, there's been a uh, a move to, you know, have budget scrutiny started over several lawmakers instead of just a few. What one last uh, thing comes to mind? You know, um, we've heard a lot of news about how how people's tax bills have changed uh, beyond expectations uh, in view of the first year uh, of reporting under the tax reform, the Federal Tax Reform Act, twenty seventeen. And some of them have gotten less of a refund than they thought, meaning some of them have paid more tax than they thought they were going to pay, and that they were, they were they had false expectations. Is that like false news? Yes, it is. False expectations um, of the benefits they were going to have under the Tax Reform Act of 2017. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure what benefits they were expecting, but I, um, the National Tax Foundation has done some studies that, that, that said uh, that people, by and large, did get a benefit. Okay. My, my question, though, is, does anything that has happened with respect to the Tax Reform Act of 2017 um, engage, uh, interact, uh, synergize with what is happening in the legislature? Is the legislature taking steps to, to deal with, either push back or somehow accommodate on the changes in the federal law? And if not this year, is that going to be appropriate next year? 
Well, um, there were just a couple of minor technical corrections. Uh, they're, they're, they are planning to adopt for state purposes the federal opportunity zones. Um, which, well, what is that exactly? That's, that's where you get to, you know, if you invest in a certain designated area, um, you get either capital gains deferral or capital gains forgiveness, depending on how long you keep the investment in, in the uh, designated region. That's mostly for investors, though, and yes. businesses rather than the ordinary person. Right. Anything else? Um, well, we're, we're always around, so uh, if you are, you're, you're uh, adoring public has uh, tax questions, <laughs> just send them our way, and we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, happy to try What's to answer. What's your website, Tom? Uh, tfhawaii.org. Uh, TF for Tax Foundation. Hawaii is spelled out, and .org, just like, just like, Fintech, just like ThinkTech. And, uh, and, and, and we have a, a tax watchdoggy, too. <laughs> Good. That's uh, Tom Yamachika, president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation. He joins us every couple of weeks where we try to keep our fingers on the pulse of taxes in the state of Hawaii. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show. Aloha.